guy that wrote the book on retirement, anybody that's read Bunch of Bites knows that there's a lot in there about um, the transition from careers uh, to retirement, is supposed to have all the answers for that. And I realized that uh, none of us have any answers for this time in our lives. And it kind of brought me back to the reason why I wrote the second book, which, which is um, uh, called Late Fragment Notes on the Later Stages of Life. So um, the reason why I'm here is because of the two books. And uh, one of my buddies um, stopped me one day and said, you know, Chuck, I think your uh, title of your first book, uh, A Survival Guide for Aging Lives, is kind of arrogant. It uh, <laughs> seems like if you're professing, um, maybe you're a charlatan, if you're professing that knowledge you don't have. And, um, and so I started to think about the audiences that I speak to. And the thing that should be in your mind today is, what does this burned out heart surgeon, what would he say today that would be of any interest to me? Why would I come? Why would I want to hear what he has to say? Well, I'm going to double down on the arrogance because some of the stuff that we're going to cover today has the potential to change your life. And so what I want you to do is kind of open your mind, kind of open your heart, and we're going to go over some things that people who are not in this stage of life don't understand. They don't even begin to understand what every day is like in, in your apartment and in your house and in what you go through to get up and get home. And I had a little bit of that insight over these last uh, month. And uh, it's good to know that uh, Mary um, has not divorced me, although I don't think that the final decision has been made. <laughs> the, first book, the first book, and I saw several people brought it in, Nothing More Is My Heart More. Um, don't share it with your neighbors. Okay? <laughs> uh, um, the first book uh, covered the transition uh, from careers uh, to retirement. But what it was really about was about the effects of aging on a normal brain. And um, I had to, as I got more and more involved uh, with aging and a pathological process, which is dementia, I began to realize that normal aging is nothing more than a nuance of that drastic changes. We go through all of these ourselves. They're, they're minor, more nuanced, but they are there. And so uh, when you start to doubt, you say, oh my God, we're going to talk a little bit about things not to worry about today. Um, get out that book and, and read some of it because it will make you feel better about where you are. All right. Late Fragment. Late Fragment, the second book, um, was much harder to write. And it came out of a much deeper place, uh, a much deeper place in me and a much deeper place in my relationships with my patients and my soulmates in the late fragment. Um, now, here's where it goes. The late fragment is defined as that interval in life that's past career, past active retirement, past travel, past volunteering, and Everything that everyone thinks is a big thing in your life or important, they think it's beyond you. It's gone. Okay. Oh, wait, there's one other thing that's coming, and that's your own death. Now, who in the world would write a book about that? Okay. Where did the idea come from? My wife, Mary, when I started writing, she said, what are you writing about? And I told her, I said, I'm writing about the end of people's lives. That time where we need some things to hold on to. And of course, it came from my experience with my patients and my families. And uh, she said, Well, that's going to be a real thigh slap. People are going to be really good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I want to read uh, a little bit about what I said in the introduction. I'm just going to read just a short bit here. I have two aspirations for the book. First, that all involved, the children, families, colleagues, and people next door will understand the challenges faced by my soulmates 
in the later stages of life. I want those aging individuals to be approached with honor for the lives they have led. I want this understanding and respect to lead to the development of strategies to ensure that the time left is dignified and, if possible, enjoyable. Second, that the individuals who are living close to the end don't give up. I want them to find new, clever ways to remain vital. They still think, they still know things we need to know. As in other times in my life, what I expected was not what I got. But what I got was far better than what I ever expected. I was thrown off course early when the search took me to some unexpected dark places. I worried that there would not be enough resolve, enough hope, to justify the search. I have never been more wrong in my life. The more individuals I interviewed, listened to, and befriended, the more I realized the courage, resolve, and tenacity in these aging individuals was more than a match for challenges of living a long time. We're going to cover these challenges in depth, and I'm going to offer soft suggestions and directions for meeting and overcoming them. More importantly, I need your trust that I would never have started this book unless I thought I could deliver on the promise of making this late fragment of life not just tolerable, but worthy of the lives that preceded it. This will be a wild ride. Hold on. So that's where I started. Um, where, where the idea came from was I was giving a talk at a retirement center just like this. And they wanted me to talk about much advice. And I realized that the audience that I was getting ready to talk to was past much of us. And I became, uh, I was thinking, what is it that I could say that would make them be valuable to them? And I realized that I didn't have enough information. I didn't understand what their lives were like. And um, so that's where the idea came. What is it that in those later stages of life, what is it that gives it value, and what are the things that we can hold on to? Um, the two books share three major things. The first is time. The second is the adjustments that we have to make in life for each phase that we're living in. Each phase in our lives requires that we have awareness of what's going on, and the only way that we stay relevant and connected is to change. If we don't change, and we think that everything is in my day, or that's the way we used to do it, we get isolated, and we get alone. So part of the book is teaching us the steps of how we stay connected. The third thing is, the third thing, is the crucial importance of other humans. When you come together in a, in a forum such as this, what I'm saying is certainly, hopefully, it's, um, it's interesting and important, but it's walking down the hall and talking to the person next to you or coming in and sitting down and you say, how are you doing? And someone says, well, you know, I've just had this. And you think, I better call her because she's not doing well. This interaction, every retirement center, and I have patients in every one of them, has a culture. And the only thing that makes it valuable and worthwhile is the connection between each other. How do we care for our friends? How do we feel connected? Let's begin with time, the common thing. Today in the United States, there are 80,000 people that are 100 years old. 80,000. In 2050, 27 years from now, 26 years from now, that number will be over 400,000. And lots of us boomers will still be around. Now, when I do 26 on 76, I'm pushing a little bit, I know. But there are going to be some of us in this room that's still going to be here. Um, it's interesting. The longer you live, the longer you are going to live. If you make it to 70, the average age of a person 70 years old is 85 years old. If you make it to 80, you get this tremendous pop. 89, 
is your average lifespan. Okay? 90 gets you to 95, and 100 will get you to 102. My mother-in-law, uh, Ann Babcock, uh, she made it to 100, and then she lived two more years. And she uh, died uh, this year uh, at 102. What a gift modern medicine has given us. Okay? It really has. Um, the things that have made a big difference, of course, are vaccines, antibiotics, and most importantly, that one in 12 women died during childbirth at one point in time. Can you imagine that? 80% of people, women, died in childbirth. And a lot of the reasons why we are living longer is because of people like my friend, Pinkney Rankin, who um, was serious about the uh, high-risk pregnancies and women started to live through those high-risk pregnancies. Um, 2022 was the first year since 1900 that the lifespan of an American went down. And it went down and you would say, ah, COVID. No, because most of the people that died of COVID were already in that advanced age or they fell into being diabetic and obese and those people were not going to change those statistics anyway. Over the last three years, we've had 300,000 young people die of fentanyl poisoning. 300,000 people. It is unconscionable, and, um, and I don't understand why we are ignoring it. Uh, the answer is not when you find someone on the side of the road to give them Narcan. That's not the solution, because if you're not there, the next day it's just going to happen. So, when will we receive this gift of time? That's the name of the chapter. Um, am I going to get to uh, have more than uh, 12 years uh, or four years, three years at Myers Park High School? Am I going to get four, more than four years at UVA? Are my children going to be with me longer? No. Marginally, there are going to be some differences in our lives. Careers will probably be a little bit longer. And maybe active retirement will be a little bit longer. But the majority of the time of this gift is going to be tacked on to the end of lives. A late fragment. Okay. Um, the term late fragment comes from a poem by a, a, a poet and a writer named Raymond Carver. Um, he is really known for his short stories. And he's also known for the raw use of words and his uh, sort of pugnacious way that he interacts with uh, the uh, reader. Uh, but you can count that he's not going to back up. Um, he writes this poem, which is only four lines long. Uh, he's 50 years old and he's dying of cancer. He uh, was a almost hopeless alcoholic uh, and at age 40 was in the hospital uh, and uh, under hospice care. And he survived 10 years, the most productive years of his life. He wrote a poem just before the end called Gravy, because that last 10 years was gravy. And so the poem goes like this. And did you get what you wanted out of life? Even so, I did. And what did you want? I wanted to call myself beloved, to feel the love on this earth. Explain, um, my next slide is explain even so. Now think about this. Did you get what you wanted out of life even so? Slang term, throw away. And yet it means all the ups and downs that we've been through. Okay? There is no life that doesn't happen. Each of us, and each of us has a lot more even so coming. But when you do the math with all the ups and downs, was it a life worth living? And we still have time to evolve, no matter what your age is. But there are probably about as many definitions for beloved as there are people on earth. Every person has a different um, sort of perspective where um, that term beloved would mean my children, or my grandchildren, or someone that I was close to at work that I tutored who became president, and everybody would have a, a different definition of the love. But I guarantee you, it's going to involve other human beings. 
that connection to other human beings is the vital link to others, is the source of authentic value and joy in every life. And when we become, when I start to worry, and part of the things in the book, when I talk about this one character uh, who lost his wife and he couldn't come back from it, and he was suicidal, and I talk about the science behind despair, and I talk about being alone and reclusive, and the impact that that has on us. We have to find, if our family doesn't do it, we have to find new families and create new families that can do it. The book, Late Fragment, is divided into three parts. The first part is called Background, and all I do is define it. I hope everybody does it. Put the book down once I've defined late Friday. And it also tell you who's in it. Probably the most, the largest group are just old people. You live long enough and you get a bid to be in the late Friday. Okay. And um, I also talk about each one of those groups and their specific um, why they're in it. The uh, um, and all that does is defines. Who, what we're talking about, what time period, and, and who's in it. One of the things about, if you're in the late fragment, I've had several people call me or stop me, and they say, Dr. Evans, you were talking to me in that chapter. That's exactly the way I feel, or that's where I see myself. And what I do is I throw you into a myriad of situations. They're stories. And you either benefit from the trials and struggles of others, or you see yourself and realize I have to change. I, some people say that aren't in the late fragment, it doesn't resonate with them. They're not quite, they say, well, you know, I think of my mom. Well, that's part of the reason why I wrote it. I want you to think of your mom. But, um, uh, so as we age, these signs of aging are hard to take. The first, Aging is seen and felt. It's seen and felt. What we see is we look in the mirror. We see those wrinkles. We see the sort of coarsening sometimes of our features. And we look at it and we go, I'm looking at a stranger. I can't even believe that that's my image in the glass. Um, the second thing is seen is, is felt. That unsureness when we walk with our balance. You know, we're going along, and the next thing you know, sometimes we've fallen or something. We say, wait a minute, what, what happened there? Uh, or we do some sort of silly exercise or some move, and the next thing you know, we're holding our back, and we're kind of crawling in, hoping no one will see us and realize how old we are. Uh, so um, also in slowness in reaction and slowness in our response to what's going on in real time. And I spent a lot of time in, in Much of Eyes, the first book, talking about what is it that normal aging does and how do we have to make adjustments to that. And once we, once people write me all the time and say, I want to thank you for you know, making me feel better about that. Um, now, there's a way that you can avoid the insults of aging. We can avoid it. Um, you have to die. <laughs> For me, I'm going to take the wrinkles and the soreness and try to make the best of it. But here's, here's how we deal with this aging. If the goal is to live a long life and we get that gift, we cannot undermine the satisfaction of having made it by resenting the compromises that are inherent in the process. We have to accept where we are in time. If we took, let's say that we are looking for a CEO of a large company, we'd never go look over at a high school and say, let's get one of these juniors in high school to run this company. But the adjustments we have to make in the late fragment are the most important and the most profound of our lives because Think about this. In every other stage of life, there's always a future that has a definition. That means I'm going to be alive in that time and I'm going to be retired or I'm going to be playing golf. Or the definition of time. What does time look like? What does it mean to us? When we're younger, we can't even imagine that we're going to get old. 
doesn't even resonate. Resonate. So here we are, aging, and it's almost like someone has changed the rules. Someone has moved the goalposts. But actually, it's even more profound than that. It's not even the same game. And what much abides, and especially late fragment, is about is giving you the new rules and what it's going to take to keep you balance as we get all the way to the end. The late fragment, though, on the upside, has the potential to be the best years of our life. Okay? It has the most potential for us to be authentic and fearless. I love that word. Because when we are trying to live, when we have the pressures of the outside world on us during when we're in the cars of power, it's not really our life. It's trying to measure up. What do I do today to measure up? How can I make, how can I protect my children? How can I, how can I go out and do something that's going to ensure I have enough money to do that? And yet when you get in the late fragment, all that competition should be gone. All we're interested in is, who am I? What do I want this to look about, look like? And also, what are still the demands that are on me from other people? That's all it is. That's all authenticity is. You don't get to, don't get to stay in bed. You don't get to be um, uh, uh, alone. I want you out. I want you interacting with other people. And I've always liked the way that Sharon Towers, excuse me, I know you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> that Sharon Towers, I always felt like that, uh, and I would say this repeatedly, repetitively, uh, that with uneven couples, where one person was whole and the other might be down ticked with a little bit of memory loss, no place in Charlotte did better than this place. They were kind, they were aware, and the staff was particularly good at that. Um, all right, so this late fragment can be tricky. Um, all right, the part, the second part of the book is called Jeopardy. And um, it's, where, it's where I lay out what gets us into trouble. What is it, what, what is it that causes us to miss out on the relevance and the affirmation that we need. What is it? I'm going to tell you a little story. And it's about a, a woman. I call her Paige. I can't remember what I call her. Paige something. It's a good story. But she and her husband have lived in Salisbury all their lives. They had almost a perfect life. And they moved. I had a move into the Pines. But then I had to change it because that was too close to the truth. And I always have to hide, you know, what's going on. All the stories are true. And they come from uh, my uh, interviews. I interviewed about 70 uh, people. Um, I got better at interviewing. Um, I, I got better. Not so much the questions were the same. I began to understand what the answers were. And so um, uh, this uh, woman and her husband, uh, I call him Spence, um, they, he went to Chapel Hill. And so they think that uh, two of their uh, couple friends in Salisbury uh, left to go to Richmond and one went to um, somewhere else to a retirement center. And they made a decision to move into a retirement center in Chapel Hill. And um, I asked her, I said, you're happy in Chapel Hill? And, and uh, uh, she said, well, I, I can't say I'm unhappy, but I can't make the jump to happy. And I said, well, explain that to me. And she said, well, you have to understand the perfect life we had in Salisbury. Um, my uh, husband was a respected um, physician there. He actually sent patients to me, so I, I, I knew him. And, um, and she said, um, I think we've made a mistake. Um, uh, and I said, well, why? She said, well, I can't play tennis anymore. I said, well, I have tennis courts at your retirement center. She said, well, oh, that's my hip. I fell and I can't play tennis anymore. But I miss my garden club, I miss my church, and I really miss my friends. And um, 
She says, uh, also now Spence is starting to show some memory issues. Well, he actually wasn't showing memory issues. He was depressed because he couldn't deal with her being feeling that she was unhappy. And his job, he felt, was to make her happy. And of course, if mama ain't happy, <laughs> so um, I'm having a discussion with her, and and we get into it a little bit. And I just want to read the end of the conversation I had with her. Um, I, I love her, uh, but she is tough. Paige, I am angry. I feel alone. But I'm not so sure I feel, uh, I follow what you're getting at. And I was telling her that it's an illusion to her that she could return to Salisbury and have that same life. It's not there. Salisbury, they didn't move from Salisbury. Salisbury moved from them. So I say to her, now that we have established the real enemy, not the move, but the attacks on us from the passage of time, we can use the weapons we possess more strategically. You have drawn the lines of defense too close to you. You have not included your husband, and he is suffering from the isolation and anger. I want, she said, I, I love the fact that she's defiant. But I say, I want the defiance to say, I'm going to protect this marvelous man, and the two of us together will be a formidable team to fight this potential for despair. I want the defiance to say, my attitude, my perspective can make any situation better, and I refuse to let selfish negative thoughts undermine our struggle. I want the defiance to say, I have room for new friends that I can connect with to give and receive help when needed. And I want the defiance finally to say, I realize now that I have to connect with others through our shared vulnerabilities not with the remorse of things I have lost. In the late fragment, we don't connect on our successes. Whether or not we were CEO of the biggest bank in Charlotte or president of this or Dr. So-and-so, we do not connect on that. How much money you made, no one gives a damn. What we connect on is our vulnerabilities, our humanness, and our ability to see humanness in others. I don't want, what happened to Paige was that she drew this line right next to her. I'm gonna be defiant. And she didn't include her husband who was over here and suffering, suffering. She comes back and uh, she is mad at me. <laughs> One month later, Paige, I should be furious at you. You call me selfish, angry, delusional, and implied even more sinister attributes. I had always considered myself a good person. C-H-E, our brains don't like to confront pain. She said it was painful. I had gotten into a trap and I could see no way out. It wasn't until I realized that my anger was hurting those around me and more than anything was hurting me that I started back. I'm not completely there, but I am more positive they were arguing, they had never argued in their life. And the daily spats, she says, are gone. We we're both thinking ahead and trying to connect with life in Chapel Hill. I said, I'm proud of you, especially for not firing me. And Peggy says, don't think you're out of the woods yet. <laughs> so, the, uh, so the series of, of, um, of the pitfalls, of what gets us into trouble. Um, uh, I, I, I spent a lot of time putting you in those places. Uh, and then in part three, it's called Directive. And I took the title from a poem by Robert Frost, this marvelous poem called Directive, where he leads us in a poem um, through this deserted um, uh, landscape where a town used to be and everything is gone. But he's leading us to this spring where if we drink from the spring, we can be whole beyond confusion. And that's what I wanted to do in the last part of the book. Um, and so what I do is this is where I give you some solutions. And I also, I give you grab bars of things to hold on to. 
they are rather simple. One is called resilience. Resilience. And it's about my high school English teacher, um, uh, Kathy McCarthy. Is she here? Where is she? Did you have Miss Baker? I don't know. Were you in the class with me? I, okay. Because I'm an A plus. I don't know about you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You know I have A pluses. <laughs> uh, and it's about her. I call her Evelyn Brooks. Her name was um, Evelyn Baker. She was amazing. And the name of the chapter is Resilience. And um, she used to start every class um, with these quotes. And she had about 12 of them. And she would start them. And then we would have to pick up the cadence. And we, uh, they were from Coleridge. They were from uh, Thomas Gray. They were from Shakespeare, um, Pope. Um, I still know every one of them. Um, and um, what she was trying to do was to etch those sayings in a love of literature and poetry into our souls, and into our brains, and realize that if we got into trouble and our lives started to lose color and become gray, that you could always go back to those places and connect with that literature and um, and be whole again. Um, the second part of that is a, is a, another a, two sisters that I took care of together, oddly oddly close and oddly separable uh, about how they lived out their lives. Uh, but resilience, I redefine it. Resilience is adapting uh, to new new uh, situations in a dictionary. But I want that defiance. I want that resilience to say, I have got a few years on me, okay? And, and age can be hard on the body, but it doesn't have to be hard on our souls. We don't give up our place in line because we're older. We want that resilience to be a defiant, that I am going to stay authentic till the end. I'm going to tell you what I think, I'm going to tell you why I think it, and I'm not going to apologize for who I am. Um, the second is a really important scene that I, I come to um, uh, every day. I have a clinic um, at one of the retirement centers. It is a library, and I always take about a 15 or 20 minute break um, and sit there in the library. And there's a man there that you all know well, everybody in Charlotte. He was sitting there one day, and I said, uh, I called him. I can't remember what I call him. Um, um, I think I call him William. He's, um, and uh, he's sitting there, and he's, he's very sad. I said, uh, what's going on? He said, I lost my best friend, uh, the last person in my life. His wife is dead. His friend's wife is dead. His buddy went to the emergency room. He never came back. This was his first day sitting at this table. And he told me the story about how now he spends a lot of his time with people who are no longer alive. And he tells us the stories of two people who died young that still come to him every day. And he thinks about them. And so here we have these lives. And the more older we are, the more likely we are to have parents or mentors or people that we love that are no longer with us. And the travails of every day, the anxiety, and trying to hold this life together prevents us from connecting with them. Who were they? What would they say to us now? How did they do things? And we can't get them back unless we are actively trying to find them. We try to search for those people who were so important to us. But we then start to think about our lives and what their lives were like and try to bring them back. Um, I have a chapter in there called um, Changing Roles, and it comes from a discussion I have with my grandchildren, or my grandson, who's named Chuck, uh, about tattoos. <laughs> um, and uh, he teaches me, he teaches me in this marvelous, soft way about, he says, Gramps, Grampy, I don't think that tattoo has anything more to do with that with that girl that we were in that restaurant with than his his 
coach who coaches him in baseball and had a tattoo on his arm. Um, and so I, I, I encourage you to read those chapters because these are stories. These are real people, real stories, and they teach us how we stay relevant. Um, I'm going to read one of the stories in part three. I'm going to read the whole story. It's not that long. You all, actually, the people that I wrote this story about, lived here. And you may recognize it. Um, they are marvelous people. Uh, if I get choked up, um, it's because um, I still love them. So much depends upon lunch. All of the art in the book was done by my daughter, Leslie. Um, she's amazing. She did that portrait of me and gave it to me just before we um, um, released the book. All right, here's the story. Let me tell you a love story. It involves Alex Jackson and his wife, Norma Berkeley. It's not their name. They have been married 64 years. Alex is 85 years old. Norma is a year older. They live in a retirement community, which we share in Towers, here in Charlotte. Both of them lived in Charlotte their entire lives. Alex has been a phenomenon from an early age. He was valedictorian of his class at Myers Park High School and in his class at Princeton. He joined the Marines rather than being drafted, spending two years on active duty just before Vietnam. <laughs> Following discharge from the service, <clears throat> he turned down scholarships to Harvard and Yale to come home to Chapel Hill. It was always odd that Alex was never described as brilliant or even smart. <clears throat> what was said was, <clears throat> he's the kindest person on the planet. Norma was in the same high school class as Alex, but they didn't date until they wound up in Chapel Hill together. She received a master's degree in English. He studied law. And after graduation, they returned home. Norma taught English in the public schools, and Alex joined a law firm in Charlotte. They adopted one child, a daughter, Nicole. As you might guess, Alex was a stellar, had a stellar career as a corporate lawyer, sought out for his common sense and insight, and Norma was equally successful in her 45 years of teaching. They brought both work into their 70s. Retirement was seamless. It gave them more time together doing what they pleased. They traveled the world and enjoyed family and friends. A lifetime passed by. Seven years ago, they moved into a retirement center at the same time as three close couples. Initially, they were in a cottage, but three years ago, they relocated to the main building in deference to declining mobility. About the time they made that switch, Alex was involved in an auto accident. While entering on a busy street past a blind curve, he was hit by an oncoming car. The damage done to both cars was nothing compared to the damage done to Alex's confidence. I never saw it coming, he explains. Instead of blaming the speed of the other car, he took full responsibility and sadly never drove again. Norma always drove. He sat vigilantly in the passenger seat. The thought that he might hurt someone guaranteed that he was always nervous driving anywhere. They drove at night. They never drove at night, excuse me, and drove only in familiar surroundings. I will let Alex explain why they have come to see me. Chuck, I am slowly going downhill with my memory. I struggle with names of dining room and literally trying to remember the names of people I have known all my life. Norma is amazing with names and she covers for me. I have sleep apnea, but I no longer am able to follow the steps to use the CPAP. I have quit trying. I know you say that names and technology don't matter, but they matter to me. I know I am slipping and I see an uncertain future. Take reading, for example. Norma and I never watch TV except for sports. We are both readers. Norma is an English teacher and will often will read the same book, sometimes reading to one another. In a new book, I have trouble remembering the storyline from one day to the next, from one day to the next. Because of this, we started watching Masterpiece Theater on PBS. I need subtitles to understand what they're saying. Even then, I lose the plot line. I say to him, so do I. Um, AJ, I'm asking repetitive questions, and short-term memory is going. I meet with Norma alone. 
She confirms what Alex says and shares other details. She adds, he always apologizes when he asks me to repeat something. I know it's killing him, but it doesn't bother me. At our age, I think we're holding our own. We do our thing. A careful history, physical exam, neuropsychiatric testing, uh, MRI, and a full set of labs. His blood pressure is marginally high. Uh, his MRI shows what's called white matter changes from lifelong high blood pressure. But, um, uh, but more prominent than you'd expect, even for uh, 86. For someone at his intelligence level, even though he made a good score on our MOCA exam, I feel there's a problem. Here he is. Uh, I explain it's mild cognitive impairment. It is defined as mild memory loss that doesn't interfere with everyday life. It's called amnestic because at this point, it only affects short-term memory. There is no depression and no medication is needed. Parting advice is simple and reassurance. Alex, 90% of your life is working in an enviable fashion. We're not going to let the 10% that doesn't, that isn't, undermine our happiness. At 85 and 86 years of age, you are both still on the honor roll. Three months later, they come back. CHE, I'm happy to report your blood pressure is now normal. High blood pressure drives memory loss. This positive response will keep you from declining. Uh, I'd like to know what your routines are. What is going on at your house when things are working? On any given morning, when you wake up and say, this is going to be a great day because of this, what is this? Norma, we are slaves to routine. We get up at the same time every morning, 7.30. We have the same breakfast every day, orange juice, English muffin, red pepper jelly, and coffee. AJ, the English muffin is the crowning achievement of Western civilization. <laughs> C-H-E, I agree. Norma. If we have family obligations, they would dominate, but that's rare. At breakfast, we sit down and plan where we're going to lunch. We eat one major meal a day, always at lunch. It may seem trivial, but we consider it the secret sauce to happiness on a given day. I say, I love this. Where do you go? AJ, depends on the weather. We have about five go-to places. We rotate depending on different factors. It's a complex and nuanced decision. <laughs> C-A-G, what's the weather have to do with it? A-J, if it's raining, we can't go to one of them. C-A-G, what are they? Where are the five places? Phil's Deli, Shake Shack, Chick-fil-A, Brick Tops, and Dairy Queen. <laughs> Each place has a different vibe, not only because of the food, but mostly from the people we encounter there. For instance, Brick Tops is a reservation place. We love some of the dishes, but the clientele is affluent and predictable. We like to sit at a vantage point, vantage point and watch the world go by. There is no place to do that there. We love characters, and characters don't hang out at brick tops. <laughs> C-H-E, what's your bottom, favorite, bottom line favorite? Norma, Dairy Queen, by far. <laughs> AJ, no question, Dairy Queen. Me, I ask why. First of all, the food is great. We always split everything. We get a foot long and split it. We have to negotiate the blizzard. I think the Butterfinger is the bomb, but Norma tries to hold out for Heath Bar. But the real reason is the vanity. There's a park bench next to the outdoor tables. We can see everyone and everything from there. Everyone is equal at Dairy Queen. You wait in line outside, no VIP tables or favored guests at Dairy Queen. If it's raining, everybody gets wet. Norma, it is America waiting in line. It is near the courthouse, and Alex always recognizes the lawyer standing next to the judge. Right behind them is the defendant with an ankle surveillance device on his ankle. There is something about that line that makes the whole scene authentic. It is just fun to watch. There is an indoor-outdoor nursery next door. We walk through there to see all the orders. Norma, we love lunch. Why is this story important? Why a whole chapter of two people going to lunch? I think you know the answer. For starters, it's not about lunch. It's about love. Why do you think they were able to deal with this memory loss so effectively? 
Here is a man who could always rely on one thing in his life. It never let him down. His intellect. He was just not smart. He was a wonder kind. He is aware that this gift is being slowly taken away. He has lost the ability to follow plot lines and read for content. However, his saving grace is the devotion from his wife that trumps the memory loss. The apologies for asking repetitive questions are met with affirmation and love. They are a formidable team asking no quarter for the subtle chinks in the armor brought on by their shared longevity. Anticipation is the human capacity to look forward to, expect, envision the future. It has a positive connotation and is linked to hope and promise. In slang, it is to be on to something. The something can be anything. It may be lunch, a walk, a big game, bridge, gardening, or an encounter with a person you love. It doesn't matter what, as long as it provides even one skip in a long line of heartbeats. I would give anything to say that the rituals for Alex and Norma are still in play. They are not. Alex survived the first of two strokes and returned close to baseline. The second stroke closed the book. Suddenly, thankfully, Norma moved into assisted living immediately. She lost contact with reality without him and declined rapidly. I have been to the Dairy Queen and I've sat on the bench where they shared the long. The blizzard and the search for character. I'm not saying in the grand scheme that this was all that important. No, wait. I'm saying it is all that important. It borders on crucial. In the late fragment, our day-to-day -day routine might not have as big an impact as our actions during our careers. But these rituals are a huge reason that joy and delight are attainable no matter how long we live. They might not involve a major business success, but lunch is, after all, lunch. It will always be important in its own way. After all, life's huge business deals never come with a blizzard. Just saying. So, uh, so that gives you a little bit of an idea of, of the type of situations that we um, are, that we uh, present. Now, what I'd like to do real quick, because I want to give you a little bit of science um, from the first book, Much Abides. And now I'm going to let you go. I know that y'all are tired of listening to me. But um, in Much Abides, I take 10 mistakes, 10 common mistakes that people make um, in aging. And the reason why I use mistakes is because, let's say that you're getting ready to go into battle, and your commanding officer says to you, um, soldier, I want you to be careful today. You go, I'm going to try to be careful. It's not quite as effective as he says. There's a landmine about three feet from you, and if you step there, you're going to be gone. Mistakes, they have a tendency to focus us. I don't want to make the mistake. It's not like, oh, here are things you can do. It's not quite as effective as trying to show you the mistakes that get you into real trouble. And there's 10 of them. And today, I'm going to go over just two of them. Uh, but they kind of get to the heart of a lot of sort of um, the science behind aging. The, um, the uh, first one uh, is, and, and the other eight are actually the really important ones, but you got to buy the book to. Um, <laughs> uh, the first one is not being aware of the effects of aging on our brains. Every week we have people that call me, and there's a scene in the book. Um, where uh, someone that you all know, very, very well-known character in Charlotte, calls me and says, I'm losing it. And he tells me a scenario of how he's left the refrigerator door open two nights in a row, and, and he says, I'm losing it. So, uh, so every week I have to deal with people that want me to drop everything because they think they've got dementia, and we bring them in, and they really don't. So I'm going to try to make you feel better. What are things that you don't have to worry about? Okay? First thing, names. You all know that oftentimes y'all don't want to go to the dining room because you're worried that you that 90% of the people that come to the door, you panic because you can't remember their name. Someone that was your sister that you come through the door and you can't remember her name. Yeah, that's a bad one. But you know, 
Uh, so I don't care about May. Right? That part, of, there's no reason why the moniker is an abstraction. There's a person that you know, and if someone says, do you know so-and-so, or you, they're describing someone, you can think of everything about them, who they were, that you played on the same Little League baseball team, you can remember everything about them. You just can't remember that name. Doesn't matter, okay? Second thing is technology. I don't care about technology. The reason why is because our ability to um, sort of navigate technology goes down dramatically from the age 28. Now, technology has changed aging. I'm probably eight, nine, ten years old. My grandfather takes my brother and I everywhere. Every word he said was gospel. Okay? We thought he was just, he would take us to these battlefields. And at first, you know, we would um, be hanging on every word. And then when we started reading the markers, we realized he didn't have any idea what the battle was. <laughs> but his stories were so much better. But he got into trouble one time. He was telling us about the, the uh, Yankees and the Rebs and all this stuff. And it was a revolutionary war battlefield. But it didn't matter. Okay. But that respect, that reverence we had for him was inviolable. still there. For us, now in our generation, our grandchildren think they're smarter than we are because they can do the iPad and that cell phone better than they can do it. And they will literally pull it out of your hands to do it and hand it back to you, okay? And it's reinforced because as soon as they come over, you're asking them why you can't turn your TV on anymore. Okay? <laughs> so I don't care about technology. One of the things I want people to be aware of is that as we age, except for super agers, and there's a chapter in Much Abides about super agers, we don't pick up errors as quickly as we used to. Okay, When we are doing our taxes or we're doing our uh, balancing our checkbook, we used to do it in 20 minutes, no problem. Now, we may take two hours and it's still not done. And you're under the philosophy that if I still have checks, I still have money. Okay? <laughs> That's been done lots of times. Uh, where you really need to pay attention is when you're driving. When you are, you sit for a few minutes for, for 15 to 20 seconds and think about where I'm going and what I want this to look like, where I'm going. I want to go through the, uh, I'm going to drive down Sharon. I'm going to turn left on Fairview and I'm going to go out Tybola to go to Costco. And you do that in your brain, and you, um, but because then you don't get surprised. Okay? Errors in driving are unforgivable. Uh, going into a room, you're in your apartment, and uh, you're doing something. You're putting up a picture, and all of a sudden you say, "Oh gosh, I need a nail!" And you go out into the uh, a lot, a living room, and you open up your utility room, and you have no idea why you're there. <laughs> Can't remember. Why? What you have to do is go back into the bedroom and see the hammer, and you realize, I need a nail. Okay? Don't sweat. All right, I'm going to tell you a quick story. Anybody who's heard me talk has heard this story, but it really gets the point across. Because we're all going to do screw ups. And they're going to be big. They're going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe I did that. Am I losing it? Okay? When you have two parents that died of Alzheimer's disease, it really enhances. The, the worry that you have in your brain. So I, um, on Thursday morning, um, I would see patients in their homes or in their facility. And of course, uh, y'all know where the creek is on Park Road, where the giant genie used to be. And uh, there's a coffee place in the back called Mugs. And um, I, I happen to like it, it's nice. And uh, one of my caregivers has a, had a little shop there for a while. She's gone now. She had a shop there, and her husband used to sit on this bench and watch the world go by. And he was a patient of mine. So I come out, and I've got my coffee, and uh, he goes, I know you. I said, yes, sir, Mr. Jones, you do know me. And he said, uh, high school. We went to high school together. And I said, no, Mr. Jones, I'm your memory doctor. He says, you're doing a terrible job. <laughs> so... I get into the, I get into the uh, car, 
and I start to drive away. And he comes screaming at me. He says, stop, stop. And so I roll the window down. I'm probably a little impatient or a little angry. And he reaches up and grabs the coffee off the top of the coffee. <laughs> and he says, you don't know how good this makes me feel. <laughs> so we're all going to screw up. We're all going to do those things that, that make us feel like that we're losing it. But we're not. So remember this. Anxiety over memory loss can cause memory loss. If you forget something, hold it lightly and move on. What you had yesterday for lunch doesn't matter. And it drives me crazy when your children come to visit you and they say, well, what did you have for lunch today? And you go, why would you ask me that? I'm 85 years old. It wasn't that good. And I shouldn't have to feel bad about not remembering what it was. <laughs> So tell your children, let's talk about something that happened 50 years ago, not five minutes ago, okay? Um, all right, what can you do at this stage in your life to prevent yourself from progressing with memory loss? How do I keep it in the road? All right, the number one number in your life that's important to you is your blood pressure. Now you know, that um, as you age, we accept a little bit higher blood pressure than when you're younger. Um, and today, I was seeing a doctor, and uh, he, you know, he knows that I'm a you know, surgeon and stuff, and he said, you know, my blood pressure wants 155, 160. Is that okay? No, it's not okay. The white coat syndrome, where you go in, and they take your blood pressure, and it's 162 systolic. And the nurse says, oh, uh, you say, I always get nervous when I get my blood pressure checked. And uh, she said, well, we'll just take it later. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. If it's 162, you stop and say, my blood pressure is too high. I want the doctor to know this, and I want my blood pressure to come down. Okay. I, I'll be okay with 140. And as we get up into our 80s, I don't like 110, because that would make us more susceptible to falling. But 160, 170, too high. All right? White coat syndrome does not exist. The people that have it have an increased incidence of heart attacks and strokes and congestive heart failure. The second thing is hearing loss. The number one marker for, for cognitive decline in a lifetime is hearing loss. Number one, not genetics, not cardiovascular disease, hearing loss. So if you're going, huh, huh, all the time, Get your hearing checked. Um, it's not the isolation so much as it is that the brain waves, um, you take sound, convert it to electricity, it goes in the part of the brain where short term memory is. So, um, hearing loss. Third thing is we think dental issues are not quite as important, but dental hygiene is extremely important. Okay, this sounds terrible. Flossing, brushing two or three times a day with your gun because. I think a lot of cardiovascular blockages are the result of um, bad hygiene uh, in the mouth. Also, the lifespan, one of the reasons why we're living longer is because our oral hygiene is so much better than our parents and our grandparents. Think about that. Destructive medications. I'm not going to go into all of them. No, there is no medication that has efficacy that doesn't have side effects. Okay. Now, where we get into trouble is with sleep medications. Um, Ambien uh, is what's called a benzodiazepam. And I don't want you to stop them because they're very addictive. And if you stop them, you may withdraw or you'll get really nervous. But I want the drugs that I don't like, Xanax, Ativan, Ativan, Clonopin, okay? If you're on them, talk to your physician about slowly getting off. <clears throat> Sometimes we can get you off or get you down to a lower dose, but they do have cognitive um, impact. All right, sleep. I love, if you're 90 years old and you're a male, you take a, a, a little nap after breakfast and you take a little nap after lunch. Okay, I love that. Now, the fact that your wife gets pissed off when you do it doesn't matter. Okay? <laughs> Women hate to see men sleep during the day. It's just a, it's just a thing. That second X chromosome says, I don't want to see you sleep. Why are you sleeping? Okay, so this is my deal. Go ahead and take that note. 
I like eight or nine hours of sleep. Men sleep better than women. That's part of the resentment. They're all nervous <laughs> about something, you know. Well, I've got, I've got a, um, a, a wedding coming up in two years. I don't know what I'm going to wear. You know? <laughs> it's a little different. Uh, one of the biggest effects of alcohol, as we age, we cannot metabolize alcohol as effectively as we did when we were younger. There's an enzyme called alcoholic dehydrogenase. And so when we have a drink, one drink, okay, or if you had a drink and you want to have a little bit of wine with dinner, that's fine. But having two or three stiff drinks is a disaster. Also, it undermines your deep sleep. Deep levels of sleep clean your brain up. So when you are drinking that alcohol, you're, you're actually trying for sedation, not sleep. So I want you to just be careful. Oftentimes, we, we lose the ability to sort of say, where am I in this? One drink slips slowly is just as effective as someone who sits down and has three, and the next thing you know, they're at the dinner table and they're not too sharp. Okay. Uh, exercise. I like it doesn't matter what you do. It might be walking down the hall and walking back to your apartment or walking around the block. As little as you can do is, is fine. Okay, There are benefits to that. And, and especially if you run into your friends and you talk to them. Um, I'm going to read the very end of this book. It's just got a short thing. And then if you all want to ask me a question or you want me to get out of here, I'll be glad to. Um, Here's the, uh, this is entitled Before I Go. Um, and John Milton wrote this. Gratitude bestows reverence, allowing us to encounter everyday epiphanies, those transcendent moments of awe that change forever how we experience life in the world. Gratitude, though, means that you've got to stop and think about it. You're not just got your head down and moving through. So it all comes down to this a final moment at the end of this odyssey on aging and the human experience. The three years I've devoted to writing this book has been life-changing for me on countless levels. The individuals I interviewed, interacted with, watched, and now remember, have provided a lesson plan that has reduced fears of the future and reinforced the importance of connections to fellow human beings. Many of the individuals I interviewed and befriended are no longer with us. Their fate has played out. I am comforted by the fact that their struggles and triumphs are preserved in this book, and their counsel will be available when we need it. The final question that you need to ask is this. After all the searching, listening, and talking, is there a takeaway, a final observation expressed by, these, by those individuals who survived and even flourished in the late fragment? Is there a secret to true success? The answer is yes, but it's not a secret. I just read you that quote by John Milton. He knew it in the, in the 18th century. John Milton shared it with us in this chapter's opening quote. It's gratitude. I saw it over and over. When I asked the question of an older colleague, what makes all this work? I knew what was coming. The answer was always gratitude. Gratitude has nothing to do with career success, financial security, or social standing. It is plainly dismissive of the trappings of ego. It has little to do with personal triumphs and financial acquisitions. Sadly, there are many people I interviewed who do not get the quote human memo. Their obsession with what I have achieved makes them compete with one another until the end. This keeps them from forming those pure attachments to other humans in the profound sense of well-being that comes from those attachments. But those who did get it in expressing gratitude for those pure attachments, what they were conveying was the security and joy derived from being human and being among humans, from being loved and being able to love. This became clear in the stories they told what they valued, and what raised their spirits. They were drinking from a spring that flowed from the depths of this earthly experience. They were calm, fearless, appreciative, and reverent. Humility almost always tagged along. I entitled the last book 
the, uh, the last part of this book, directly, Directive. That's the title of a magnificent poem by Robert Frost. In it, he walks us through an abandoned landscape to a hidden spring that he claims drinking from can make us whole again beyond confusion. That was my intent for this book from the beginning. I wanted to make us aware of time, how precious it, how precious it is because of its limitation. I wanted to shock us into turning away from the details that no longer matter. I wanted to connect us to a legacy left by those who got it and to see the past set for those of us who will follow. For me, I've loved our time together. Thank you. Thank you.